everyone, this is Associate Pastor Matt Pinkard. You know, I've always been fascinated with athletes. Growing up, I remember watching Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls play the Utah Jazz. Even though my family lived in China at the time, I remember watching them on TV and, and just being amazed at the hard work and the effort and all that went into those championships that Michael Jordan won. Now, of course, as we fast forward, we've seen in recent years, LeBron James in the NBA has gone to a number of NBA finals and, and won a number of championships. And then last night, now, full disclosure, I didn't watch the game, but the Super Bowl happened. And around 1045 last night, I scrolled on my phone and saw in the news that Tom Brady had won his seventh Super Bowl ring, which is more than any other NFL franchise even has. Uh, the most, I think, was six. So, yeah, just incredible to think about. And he's gone 10 times. So in the past 20 years, Tom Brady has averaged out to be in every other Super Bowl. Now, what particularly uh, sticks out to me about Tom Brady is, now, he is athletic, you know, more athletic than most of us, but he's not the greatest athlete of athletes. Like, he's not the fastest, he's not the strongest, but I was reading stories about his teammates just praising him for, for not only his work ethic on the field, but his work ethic in the film room, the way he studies his opponents and studies the plays and studies his teammates to know their strengths and weaknesses and their patterns and all these things. And I was just fascinating to learn at his devotion to the, the single-minded cause of, of winning this championship, of winning this crown, this trophy. And so I was thinking about that in light of the New Testament, where we see as Christians, there's this idea of a crown, a crown of life, a crown of righteousness. And, and so I was really encouraged, I really stirred, thinking about these themes and the need for perseverance, which of course is always a theme we need in the Christian life. Don't give up with saying no to sin and continuing to crucify our evil desires. Don't give up with serving others and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ and, and helping people around you in the world and sharing the good news and all these various things. And I was thinking about that idea of crown and that that the fact that it feels so distant sometimes, but there is a day coming. We will stand before God in judgment. And that's a heavy thought to think about, but there's also a joy in that thought. The joy of Christ appearing, the joy of the crown that we have to receive. Now, to be clear, the gospel says we are not saved by our own works. We're not saved by our righteousness. We're saved by the righteousness of another, Jesus Jesus took the wrath of God we deserve in our place for our sins on the cross. Jesus lived the perfect life that we couldn't. He obeyed God perfectly. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the God the Father. He accomplished all these things. So our justification uh, is, is not based on our own works. It's based on salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And so he declares us righteous. But as a result of that, we are called to do all these good things. And so there's a reward we have to look forward to that, we're t that we are told about in the New Testament. And so I just want to share some of these texts and comment on them. And maybe they'll be an encouragement to you uh, to, to revolve all of our lives, whether it's our job and the way we view work or our families and the way we view our responsibility to raise our children and to the best that we can, our grandchildren, in knowing God, knowing his word, and, and seeing their identity and the people around us, their identity from an eternal perspective, okay? And thinking about an eternal crown. Now, during the Greek games, they would have uh, these crowns, like the New Testament refers to, that were like made out of these wreaths that would perish. And even the trophies we have nowadays, now they're Probably certainly an improvement over a wreath that may fall apart pretty quickly. Uh, you know, my daughter still loves to like find little flowers in the yard and put them together and make a little crown around. And they're cute, right? But they don't last very long. And trophies may last for decades, and but, but they can still rust and they can still dent and break. But there is an, an imperishable crown. And so let's look at this. First, let's start in 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 23 through 27, I do it all for the sake of the gospel 
Now, pause there real quick. Oh, that we would do everything in our lives, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do for the sake of the gospel, to the glory of God, that I may share with them in its blessings. Verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? All these teams got into the NFL playoffs, but only one won the Lombardi Trophy last night. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Wow, very powerful language there from Paul. Then, he, then in the book of James, we see this in James 1.12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So brothers and sisters who remain steadfast under trial, we, we want to be this, we want to remain steadfast under trial. The crown of life, the promise of the crown of life. Uh, what what an incredible motivation for us uh, to remain steadfast under trial. Now, of course, we fail them on the way, right? Here's the encouragement. None of us is perfect. We need grace, right? That's why we still need to confess our sins to one another and, and pray for one another. Uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us and purify us and to help us endure to the end, right? This is the beautiful picture of the New Testament is that he is sustaining us as we run the race. It's this beautiful God working through us to cause us to persevere to the end. Now, Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you are about to suffer. That's a good word, right? Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And then in 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes this uh, nearing his death. We don't know exactly how long between the, the writing of this letter and when he actually died, but it was the last letter we know that we have from him in the New Testament chronologically. So in, in, in the timeline of his life. For I'm already being poured out, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Now, really interesting comment on this text. First, notice this one's a little different. It's the crown of righteousness in this translation, whereas the ones we've looked at so far, uh, James and Revelation mentioned the crown of life. 1 Corinthians 9 uh, just talks about a imperishable wreath. Uh, here we have a crown of righteousness, okay? Now, of course, we know on the day that we go to meet the Lord, whether we die or whether he comes back first and his second coming finally happens, we will be seeing the conclusion of being saved to sin no more, right? No more any sinful thoughts, no more any sinful desires or sinful actions or any of that. We will be cleansed of all of that. Just righteousness in our thoughts, just righteousness in our actions and our words. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait for that day. Uh, and notice the end of verse 8, not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Now, I know it's easy when you're reading the New Testament and you see kind of at the end these greetings and, and then at the end of the letters, uh, sometimes they have greetings and they'll, they'll have goodbyes from people, that kind of thing. Well, there's one person who appears in a number of Paul's letters that's called Demas. And it's really sad because at the end of 2 Timothy 4, we see here a few verses later that Demas who used to be one of these guys who would always greet the Christians in these different places, who you would have said, I love the idea of Christ coming back. Well, guess what's happened to Demas? He is now in love with the present world. He's rejected the gospel. He's abandoned Paul. And so it's really sad because you see a man who used to proclaim the faith is now rejecting it. And he's fallen in love with the things of this world. 
he's gone after them very clearly now. And so uh, there's a warning there for us. And, and there, there's um, insight there. Sometimes when we kind of gloss over these lists, that there's sometimes these nuggets of information that can help us. And so, uh, yeah, encur- be encouraged to continue to love his appearing, his righteousness. When he will execute justice on the earth, when he will make all things new, uh, and every tribe and tongue and nation will be gathered together forever and ever. Um, yeah, what an encouraging thought. Now, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20 has a little different flavor. There Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Now you would say, okay, what is the hope or joy and the crown of boasting? Isn't it the crown of life or the crown of righteousness? Uh, where are you getting at, Paul? Then he says this, is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. And then he says a similar thing in Philippians 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now you can just feel the affection just dripping all over the place with how Paul talks about the churches at Thessalonica and and Philippi here. Now, of course, we know from the New Testament, the book of Acts, that Paul planted these churches. So a lot of these people that he's still writing to years later would have been folks that he or his team that he traveled with would have uh, shared the gospel with and led them to faith in Christ. They would have been their quote-unquote converts. Like God used them as the agent to bring the good news and to bring salvation um, and, and repentance and faith in Jesus, uh, all that to them. So, so you can just feel the affection dripping here. But notice here how Paul uh, ties it into the the coming of the Lord and the day of judgment. These these sorts of of themes, and he ties it into the, the people that he's led to faith to to the churches that he's planted. Or, you know, of course, Paul is not the local pastor of these churches because the, they would have put elders in place, but commenting on this text is a man uh, I was reading recently from named Lemuel Haynes. If you've never heard of Lemuel Haynes, he was probably the first black ordained uh, preacher, a Baptist at least, uh, preacher in America. And so he lived uh, in the 1700s and preached during that time to a mostly to all white church for, uh, for a number of years as a black man, even throughout like the Revolutionary War and all that time, he was he was living during that time period. And so he uh, would eventually preach a sermon at a church where their pastor had recently passed away. And so uh, he, of course, gave an exhortation to preachers there. He said, look, there's coming a day of judgment when you will stand before God and you will give an account for how you shepherded the flock, how God entrusted his people to you. So how did you shepherd them? How did you care for your souls? Were you faithful in sound doctrine? Did you hide sound doctrine with lies and false doctrine? Or or maybe did you proclaim sound doctrine, but you did it with language that wasn't helpful to people or that was confusing? Or like, how did you uh, disseminate, share, proclaim God's word? Did you do it clearly? Uh, Did you preach faithfully to the word or did you preach based on people's uh, opinions or or the desires of men? Were you a people pleaser in other words? You can be faithful in many areas. Were there areas that you neglected because you didn't examine your own heart or you didn't examine the heart of your parishioners, your people, like that you decided, you know, I don't want to touch on that subject because that's going to make some people upset and you disregarded the word. Uh, these are serious things. What about your character? Did your character accurately convey uh, who God commands us to be? Did you convey God's character correctly and how you talked about him and how you taught and how you practiced, how you lived out your life, etc., etc.? So Lemuel gives all of these sort of uh, admonitions to, to pastors to what they should be doing. And they're words that we need to hear carefully, very carefully. Paul said, of course, pay Careful attention to your uh, life and doctrine. Watch them closely, being watchmen. Now, Lemuel then turns and says 
uh, this, commenting on this whole idea of this uh, being co-partners in the gospel, the idea of the crown of life and such. It will be a great ma- uh, excuse me. It will be a matter of great satisfaction to set down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Jacob, excuse me, and other saints at that day. Now pause there. I know this has been a hard year for a lot of people. A lot of people are struggling with loneliness in different ways. We're not doing all the same things we used to together, and so. I want to share with you a really encouraging thought, and that is that thought of being gathered with all of God's people in eternity, where that loneliness will cease. Now, of course, we know the Holy Spirit comforts us in our suffering. He's God is always with us uh, in those moments where, where we just feel the darkness, or we feel forgotten, or we feel alone. He is with us in those moments. But there's a great encouragement of that day when, when we will finally be surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses in the presence of all of God's people forever and ever. That's an amazing thought, to, to, be, to be reunited with family and friends who know the Lord, who, uh, to, to, be reuni- to be united for the first time with all these believers you've read about in church history and in the Bible. It's an incredible thought. But this is amazing. What, watch what Lemuel goes on to say. As amazing as that will be. But the scriptures represent that godly ministers will derive peculiar joy. So peculiar here means in particular, in in a different, more profound way. Peculiar joy from the pious part of their congregations. Reflecting on past providences will be a source of great joy at the day of judgment. And as many things have taken place between a minister and his people in which they are more particularly conversant and interested, when they come to be explained, it will afford special joy and admiration as they have been companions in tribulations. So now it is likely that they will be in a more peculiar sense, co-partners in joy and help each other in magnifying the Lord for special favors and displays of divine power and grace on their behalf. Wow, if that doesn't just reorient and encourage you and make you think about just the idea of standing before God in judgment as a pastor or or as just an ordinary church member, along with your pastor, him giving an account for your soul or how he's shepherded you. And, And just the thought of this, right? And that spurs me on as both a pastor and as a church member. It it spurs me on in both ways because all of these commands in Scripture apply to me in particular as an associate pastor in both ways. Like these commands to shepherd the flock, but also these commands to, to love and serve and do all these other things that I did before I was a pastor just as much as an ordinary church member. And uh, wow. And as, of course, a, a, having a plurality of pastors in a church, you're pastoring each other's souls as well. And so there's a lot to, to, to chew on here. So thinking about all that, there's some questions here that I uh, thought would be fruitful to ask as a result of some of these texts, uh, particularly thinking about the idea of the crown in light of being part of a church body. So great question to ask. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, particularly verse 17 talks about uh, your responsibility to obey your leaders and submit to their authority because they're giving watch for your souls. They will give an account. So let them do it with with joy and not with groaning because that would be no advantage to you. There have been times I've had to examine myself and ask, what kind of church member am I? Like, am I the kind who is a breath of fresh air to other people? Am I eager to serve uh, in different ways? Um, have I added weight to other people or, or brought them pain and, and, and suffering? Or, or have I been like a breath of fresh air and an encouragement, like an apple on a set of silver uh, tray? Proverbs 25, 11 talks about. Um, have I been friendly or have I been contentious? Like there are so many questions we can go through and ask. How have I submitted to the local church, to the shepherds God has placed over my life, to their oversight? Okay. Um, now along those lines, if you're going to submit to oversight, you have to be part of a church body. So am I diligent in gathering with God's people? Now I know this has been a difficult year with that, but I would hope that in your heart, even if you haven't been able to gather, 
um, that you've had the desire, the, the burning passion to be with God's people. And uh, as soon as you're able, you will rejoin in gathering with your people. Now, there are a lot of people in the world who make all kinds of, frankly, just sad excuses for why to not be part of a church uh, gathering and, and why I shouldn't be there. And, and there are all kinds of excuses that guide and govern our discuss, our decision making rather than submitting to the word of God. And so maybe, maybe you're listening now and you need to hear that. Maybe you need to be encouraged or like, you know, hold fast, persevere until the day you can regather joyfully. Um, but also heed the warning. Um, what kind of excuses maybe, maybe are you using um, to say, you know, I don't need all these other things that the Bible commands me to do on all sorts of different subjects. So next great question to ask, how have you listened to God's word? How have you responded to preaching, to reading the word in your own life, to apply it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Have your brother or sister's soul been as precious to you as your own? And caring for one another. Lots of great questions to ask. Uh, weighty questions. Uh, but, but I think reading on Lemuel Haynes, thinking about the judgment, thinking about this idea of this crown, it's really stirred me to, to think about these things in a fresh way. So some closing encouragement. Three simple S's that you can do. First, study. When you think about Tom Brady and you think about all the hard work these guys put in, and ladies too for professional sports, whatever, uh, man, they the, the best of the best like study like crazy to, to know their opponents, to know their teammates, to, to know all these various things. So that, that spurs me on how much more should we study the word of God seriously and how, how much should we give our lives to, to knowing it and applying it by God's grace, um, as we stumble forward in many ways, right? Like we, we stumble forward. So be encouraged, right? None of us is perfect. We're not going to attain perfection this side of eternity. Um, but we keep striving to, to please the Lord and be holy. Uh, so study, share. If you can talk about the Super Bowl at the cooler at work, if you can uh, share all those good things, you can share the gospel with someone. You can share the very simple truths of Christianity. You do not have to be uh, the kind of person that has a PhD or has gone to seminary or any of those things to share the good news. If you can share your, about your favorite movie, you can tell someone about their need for a savior from the wrath of God. And you should do that. We should be active in sharing the gospel as best we can. That includes with our own families. Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent. God has entrusted these kids to you, these kids to you. Yes, we hope for their, you know, success at finding a good job and getting a good education, but more than anything else, we think about their identity of who they are, created in the image of God, and the fact that one day they're going to stand before God in judgment. And we will have to give an account for how we have cared for their souls? Have we taught them God's word? Have we prayed with them? Have we shown them along the way throughout life to treasure God as their supreme joy in all of life and to love and know his word? And so I want to encourage you to do that and, and to seek help in the body of Christ because we're all in this together. We need each other to help grow as parents, grandparents in these tasks. And so Pray like crazy that God, if any legacy of your life would last, what a legacy it would be to raise uh, up kids and grandkids who want to know God's word and want to reproduce the knowledge of who God is and obeying his commandments to the coming generations. Go read like Psalm 78. Great testimony there. Tangent aside, last point, study, share, serve. Okay. Okay. Who do I know in the realm of my influence? Because here's the encouragement. You can't meet everyone's needs. And God didn't design it that way. But God does put particularly the people around you and your local church and the community around us to serve those people and help in different ways in different times. And so think with intentionality. Is there a need like 
that isn't being met. Maybe it's a, a known need, like someone has voiced this concern or there's a clear understanding. Maybe it's an, a silent need. Someone hasn't really spoken up about this, but you can say, you know what? I think there's a need here. And maybe you have knowledge that would help them, or maybe you have a word of encouragement. That's something I've been thinking about lately. You know, I can grow so easily discouraged and, you know, other people do too. And instead of being feeling pity for myself, I should be thinking of ways I can encourage a brother or sister in Christ uh, and think about, you know, where I can meet them where they are right now. How can I speak a word that would refresh their spirit and, and would help them to continue in the faith and all these various things? So how can I use my hands, right? Some of you have different wonderful skills that just blow my mind, the things that you can make with your hands. And so I praise God for that and for all these things that we're talking about. So final encouragement, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus. Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who ran the race perfectly, the only one who could, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of God. So consider the outcome of what he has accomplished, brothers and sisters, and don't grow weary. Endure, keep pressing in, keep, uh, keep growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, as Peter says in his letter, 2 Peter uh, 3, I believe. So thanks for watching. Be encouraged. The crown is coming. Till that day, press in. Press into Jesus. Press in to make the gospel known. God bless.